All right, so uh, we're almost done with week nine here. We're down the stretch. Yeah. <laughs> Don't act too excited. I'll take it personal. Um, so uh, we did stuff with services last time, and I mostly covered you know what I wanted to say about them last time, but um, I do want to do another example today that involves a service because um, I think the devil's in the details, and services are tricky, so I want you to see them more. I want you, you all to be, you know, good at services or comfortable with them. I mean, it's going to be a part of the next assignment. And it's, I, I would say, in general, if you're writing an Android app, you're likely to need to use them. And so, you know, I want you to, I want you to have seen them more than maybe one time. Um, that's part of the plan for today. And then with the rest of class, I want to talk about how to write an app that has a user login where you know, you'd ask the user what's their name and password or something like that, um, and different strategies for addressing that. That's also something I think that comes up a lot in mobile apps. You ask the user to create an account, or you ask them to authenticate using some existing account. So that's the plan. And uh, I've got a rough schedule put up for next week, although I'm not positive that I will stick to that, but that's kind of what I'm currently planning to cover. Um, and then that'll be the end of our, of our lectures. Uh, homework six is due, what, next Monday? Is that right? Snake game? And then I told you homework seven will go out right around then. Um, if you're the sort of person who wants to get ahead, I will make every effort to post homework seven as soon as I have it ready. And I'm going to try to do that this weekend. You know, tomorrow I'll work on it. And so it could go up as early as tomorrow or Saturday or something like that. So um, if you want to get that sneak done and you want to get ahead on the next thing, you probably would be able to do some of that soon if that were interesting to you. I know a lot of you will probably do the opposite, and you'll wait until you're done taking all your finals and stuff, and then you'll start on my homework seven. But that's fine too. But I just want to give you some some options on it. Okay? Do you guys have any questions in general? Like before I start lecturing at you, do you have any questions about kind of like where we're at, what we're doing, um, what's coming up, any kind of policies, any kind of stuff about this class that uh, might be unclear? Uh, what Homework seven will be due as late as I can get away with. Um, my general guideline is kind of at the end of the finals week time. Um, the only reason, the only like, I want to give as much time as I can. Basically, the only constraints on me, other than that, are um, if I make it due too late. I think I'm against Stanford. I can't make it be due like during uh, spring break or something, right? <laughs> You'll be in Cabo by then or wherever it is you're all going. Um, but also, I'm not positive, like, I, I need to give myself a little window so the CAs can grade them, because they want to go to Cabo as well. Um, so I, I, I basically, as late as I can get away with is how much time I'll give you. Uh, and if it goes out sort of Monday, I'll make sure you have it, I think, until at least sort of Tuesday or Wednesday of uh, finals week. Do you might know off the top of your head what's the last day of the finals this quarter? Is it, is it late in this week 11 here? Is it like the Thursday or Friday? Like 22nd, Friday. It's the Friday? Yeah. Okay, so my guess is I'll try to give you till around Thursday to do it, roughly, plus or minus maybe a day. Um, and hey, if I, if, you know, if I give you more or less time, like if I, if I feel like I can't give as much time as I thought, I'll, I'll make sure to cut the assignment down a little bit to reflect that. Yeah, okay, any other questions? We cool? Okay, well, let's start out, let's talk about services again for a minute, right? So, uh, Humor me, indulge me, uh, regurgitate things I've told you. Um, why would you want a service in an Android app? What does a service do? Yes? I can do things after you close the app. It can run even after you leave the app, after you close the app. The app's activities are not on the screen. Right. Um, it can be a little deceptive because if you jump out of your app, for a while, your app will continue to be alive, and so any code you had running in the app will continue to be running, but you don't have any control over that, and at any moment, the operating system could just like pounce on your app and free it up and destroy it, and all the work your app is doing will just stop. So you can't rely on such a thing. I just want to warn you, because I've seen lots of posts on like Stack Overflow of people who are like, hey, I wrote my app, and then I exit out of the app, and my loop is still printing, and so like, hey, I figured out a way to just have an app that runs all the time. And it's like, yeah, fine, as long as your phone, if you exit out of the app and then you just don't touch the phone, you probably have the app still running for a while. But if you go open Twitter or something pretty quick, the phone's going to flush out any other apps to make room for memory and stuff. So you can't count on that unless, as you say, you write like a service or something, right? Okay, so that's the idea. Um, what I wanted to do today, so last time I wrote this downloader program with you guys, and you know, I think it's an okay example to do for services, but I think part of the problem was 
maybe it wasn't clear. Like I think that the, maybe the motivation there is a little tougher because um, you know you don't usually actually want an app like that on your mobile phone. You don't really download a bunch of files on your phone. I wanted to try something that might hit a little closer to home closer to something you would actually write or actually use. And that is I want to write a media player program like a jukebox program, play songs. Um, so I thought I had, wait, do I, can I refresh this? Yeah, I have a starter. If you really want to look along, you can click on this starter file. But I've got a project here called Jukebox. And I just want to show you when it runs. Uh, so I mean, I show up with some code already written. I've already built this sort of simple app and my hope is that the parts I've already built are not the interesting parts, because I know it's a little disorienting when I show up with a bunch of code that you haven't seen, right? But what I've done here is I have just made a simple layout with a header, there's a text view, and then a list view of songs, and then some big cartoonish looking buttons. These are image buttons, and I can click them to play, stop, or go to the next track, okay? And <laughs> I was trying to figure out like what are the what tracks should I use, right? But I didn't want to grab real songs because I thought somebody might like sue me or something for stealing MP3s or distributing them out of my collection. So I went to the Street Fighter Two <coughs> video game and I downloaded the character musics for all the Street Fighters. Uh, for those of you who are young, which is all of you, Street Fighter Two is Street Fighter Five but older. So that's how you can you know identify with that. Um, but anyway, it's just stupid video game music songs. Um, and I mean, it's already written. Like, if I click on this, you know, it uh, it plays a song. Like, it plays a song, right? Um, I don't know if you can really hear it, but uh, it plays music from a video game. Okay, fine. And if you stop, it stops, and so on. Uh, it it's currently already set up so that if you reach the end of a track, it'll play the next track. Um, it's a little hard to test that just live with you guys because um, the songs are mostly long, like three, four, or five minutes each, and I don't want to sit here and wait to the end of a song. But I, um, <laughs> I thought, oh, I better have a shorter file so I can test that. So I Googled for the Price is Right bump, 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 woo, sound effect. The Price is Right is a TV show. TV is a thing people watch before YouTube. Um, so like... So it starts playing the next song, which is Ken's theme, Ken's badass. So, um, so anyway, just the point is it already works. So maybe it doesn't make sense why we're even talking about this finished, complete program, right? But of course, I want to modify this app to use services. It doesn't use services right now, so it has the very problem that you mentioned, which is if I exit out. I mean, you guys play music on your phone, right? And you don't like just sit here locked on the screen of the music player. You start a song playing, and then you go you know, sext each other on Snapchat or whatever, right? So you're doing something else while the music is playing. Uh, you don't want to leave the app running. So I think we want to convert this code to use as service, okay? Let me show you the code, and then maybe we could start to convert it together. That'll be what we'll do for the first part of our class today. So let me show you what I got. I got a jukebox activity here. Make this a little bigger. There. It's got an array of strings of the songs. It has a media player that's playing the current song. It also keeps track of what index it's currently playing. Um... When I create the thing, I um, read all the songs from an array. When you click on the list items, I play the song at the index that you clicked on. It's fairly self-explanatory. I'll show you the rest of the code in a second. Um, the event listeners, there's a play button that plays the song at the current index. There's a next track button that goes to the next song. There's a stop button that stops the song. I mean, these event handlers are all just sort of wrappers around other functions. And the reason I'm doing that, I think, is going to become more clear later. I just sort of I want to keep most of my logic out of like lambdas and out of like functions that depend on views and activities because some of this code's going to move to a service, so I don't want to have views cluttering up the code, right? So I've kind of intentionally structured the code to try to make it a little more amenable to the conversion we're going to do to it. Um, and then if we kind of scroll a little more, now the kind of actual work is, okay, well, if you play a song at a certain index, I look up the resource for that song and then I create a media player, and I start the media player. Um, I also do a thing that I don't think I've shown you in class, which is that if you, you can set this thing called a completion listener. So when it's done playing the song, I can tell it to like basically call a function that'll tell it to play the next song. So this code is not like super duper duper complicated, you know. Um, when you say play next song, go to the next index, index plus one, but wrap it around if it exceeds the size. Play the song. When the song's done, 
if there's a song playing, play the next song. When you stop a song, tell the media player to stop and set it to null. You know what I mean? Like, I, I think if you had half an hour to look at this code, I don't think you'd find anything in here that would confuse you, right? I don't think. So that's what we're starting from. So I want you to help me. How do I use a service to help me with this media player? What code goes in the service and like kind of what are some of the, like if this was your section exercise or your homework seven or something, kind of what are the sorts of things you would start to do to change the code? Like conceptually speaking, what's the division of labor here? Like what is the activity gonna do? And we're gonna have a service of some kind. What is that service gonna do? And how are the two pieces gonna like work together? Like kind of what's the conceptual split here? What do you think? I'm assuming the service would play the song so that when you exit the app it still plays. Yeah, um, anything that we want to keep happening while the app is not on the screen should be done by the service. And you're absolutely right that what we want is for the song to keep playing. So the actual like play, stop, just the, the meat of that part, I think, should go in a service. So the app, the activity can still do things, but it would sort of send messages to the service and tell it to do those things. And so that's conceptually the same, you know, for the starting point, but like that's the first thing we need to, to do here. Okay, so let's make a service. Now, last time when I had a downloading program, I already had a service, but this project I don't. So I, I wanted to make sure I could walk you through the creation flow. So you just sort of right click your, your package where your code is here. And this is in the slides that you say new service, new service. And it asks what it's called. So I think I'm going to call it the jukebox service because it's a jukebox project. I don't have to change anything else. I say finish. And now I get a jukebox service class that extends service. Now, um, we talked before about how there's two types of services. I, I realize that like you don't have the slides in front of you, although you could if you want to open them, but do you remember what I said about two different types of services? Um, it has to do with what functions you write and kind of the service behaves in a slightly different way. Do you remember that? You didn't know there was going to be a quiz, did you? <laughs> Do you have a an the binding ones and the ones that are starting and continue Yeah, yeah. The binding ones sort of start up and they do some work and then they sort of exit out when the work's done. And the starting ones sort of start up and they hang out and they don't go away until you tell them to go away. Uh, I think I advised you last time that uh, I think the sort of start and stick around type of service is much more common to what I like to do. This function that um, Android Studio so helpfully wrote for me is the wrong function. <laughs> it's the one for the binding service that shuts down automatically. You could make a case for like, well, when it's done playing, shouldn't it shut down automatically? I would say no, because the media player kind of keeps playing and it wraps around. So I don't think it ever really stops. So I do want this thing to just stick around. If you want it to stick around, the slides would show you that you write a method called on start command. So you just start typing its name. You don't have to memorize its signature or even its exact name. If you remember the word start or even on, you could probably get the autocomplete to help you with the rest. I press enter, boom, I get this whole signature here. Um, so uh, in the slides for last time, I told you that you should return start sticky. That's a signifier that your service is going to stick around. Um, the idea is we're gonna be sent these commands from the activity and then based on what the command says to do, we will do that, okay? So um, I think just logically speaking, we're gonna be taking a lot of these functions out of here and pasting them over in the service. That's what you told me to do. Um, now, I just want to be clear which ones, like we're not going to copy on create. That's a function that's for activities to have. We're not going to copy some of these event listeners because those trigger when buttons get clicked on. So, but I, I am, I mean, I, I try to show you guys design by example sometimes, right? Like I don't have a whole bunch of complicated logic right here because it would be hard for me to extract that, you know? So I think a pretty good practice is to like kind of not put a lot of logic in your event handlers to make them call some other function that has a lot of the logic. So kind of down here, these methods that really do the work, I think a lot of that code I want to move over, move over to the, um, to the service. For now, I'll copy it just so I don't delete anything. Uh, and I'll go down here after these other functions and I'll paste it. And it wants me to import the media player. It's mad because it doesn't have a variable called media. I think that means I need to get it from over here. Uh, I think the, the um, 
these variables are all related to keeping track of what song we're playing and stuff. So it seems like those need to transfer over as well. I mean, a lot of the, I don't, I don't know, it's, it's like sometimes you'll feel like I'm moving all the code in the service. You also might have felt this way when you were doing fragments. You're like, I took all my activity code, move it to the fragment. Now the activity is just this like sad, empty shell. It's like how I feel after a 107 exam or something, you know, but, but like, um, that's kind of what you do. You move a lot of the like logic into the service. So I'm going to paste this here. Um, it might need a little patching up, but like, okay, this thing now has some functions for playing and pausing and stopping and stuff. Yeah. When you wrote the um, the on start, like the overriding function, there was like a uh, uh, like a super that like inherited, um, but you like got rid of it. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, so let's repeat. You said if I write on start and I on start command here and I press enter, it pasted this thing here. Um, yeah, that's because like the superclass service has this function. And I think it's, I don't know what its version does, but it returns, sometimes it returns start sticky compatibility and other times it returns start sticky. I guess I could, instead of saying, what did I have? I used to have return start sticky. I could say return super. I, I mean, in, in Java, a lot of times when you override a method, the one that you're overriding might be doing something useful. So you sort of want to do your new work, and then you want to call the super one to retain the old one's work. But it looks like, in this case, the super method doesn't really do anything. I think that auto-inserted code was just Android Studio thinking like, hey, maybe you want that. You know, <laughs> I don't know what you want to return. If I don't return anything, the code won't compile. So to make it compile, I'll just have it return what the super class returns. But I just got rid of that and said return sticky. Um, so OK. So far, so good. I move some code into a service. Um, I have spoiler for you. If I run the program, it will not play the songs anymore. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess it might not compile right at this moment, but uh, I think some of this code, some of this code needs to move. Like this thing where I get the list of songs. I think that goes into the, um, you know, the creation of the service. I think there's a. Uh, on start, which is like the whole thing starting, but I could do this too. I could do um, I could do that or whatever. So okay, I've got the songs. But here, some of this code doesn't compile anymore because when I click play, it tries to call these you know functions that I don't have anymore. Um, I guess I do have them because I didn't delete them. But let me delete them. So now it's sort of mad, like when I try to do these things, those, those methods don't exist anymore. So I mean, I hope just conceptually you understand that like instead of play song, I need to sort of to do, tell the service to play the song, right? How do I tell a service to do anything? How does an activity talk to a service? Intent. Use an intent, OK. Val intent equals an intent. Usually when you create an intent, you pass the person who's interested in doing this, which is my the activity, this, and then you pass the class that you want to send the message to. So I'll say jukebox service class.java. So OK. Now um, in a second, I'm going to say start service, passing that intent. Start service either means if the service wasn't running, make it begin running, or if it's already running, leave it running and call this start command thingy on it, right? And so this intent that we make here ends up being this intent that's passed here each time. So I put a blank there for a reason. What needs to go here? Like I can tell it to start up a service, but do I need, what, what more do I need to do? Yeah. Yeah, um, so like this is a difference between that downloading program and this program. That's one of the reasons I wanted to do this demo with you guys because like the downloading program only really did one thing. It was like, here's a file, please download this for me, right? Um, this thing is going to have multiple different things. You might say, hey, service, play the song. Hey, service, uh, go to the next song. Hey, service, please stop the song. So those are all things the service will know how to do. And how do you distinguish between those like different tasks? Do you remember? I mean, intents you can you can you can put extra stuffy stuff inside of an intent, right? But that's that's not usually how we tell the intent. Like, which of your functions do you want to run or whatever? Um, it's a separate way. 
Remember? Some days I really feel I've reached all of you. <laughs> uh, I'm just teasing you. It's hard to remember all this stuff. It's complicated, right? Um, Devash, do you have a, an answer? Um, it's like a very simple thing. Like you put a string and then when the with the name of the function and then when you like in the in the service you you check what's the value of the string and accordingly run the function. Yeah, that's right. You you pack in a string of a name of what function to call. Uh, the name of that property is the action property. So I think the fact that you couldn't memorize, didn't have that memorized is fine. Like you're, you've you totally remembered the model. That's what I want you to memorize. So yeah. So I'll say something like the action to do is the play action, and then I'll start the service, and it'll say, okay, play the song. And you might say, well, I'm not telling it which song to play. I don't know. I think the service knows what song it's on. It's got a current song, and so it can play that one or something, right? So, okay. This thing, I now, like you said, I have to look for that string and check for that string on the other side. So over here, when I do this on start command, I can do something like if the intent dot uh, action is play then they want me to play a song, you know? Um, one thing, if you're just trying to be a good coder, these strings, it's kind of bad to have this string here and then check for the same string over here. Um, you know, because like, what if this guy writes capital P play, it's not gonna match and stuff like that. So sometimes what you do is kind of over here in the service, you declare some sort of constants. If you want constants in Kotlin, you make a thing called a companion object. And then you declare in here, you'll say like, const val play action equals play and maybe you have a couple other ones like um, you know stop action equals stop and I think we have like a next track action equals next or something whatever and so over here you'd say please pass the parameter of jukebox service dot uh, play action so like that way if, if he says that and then over here this one also says that it's very unlikely that they're spelled wrong, right? So that's probably a good thing to do. Um, so, right, so now here, to do, play song. Um, same thing, you know, if you, uh, if you wanna go next track, um, you're gonna do something very similar to this, right? So uh, you could even get cute and say like, well, I'm always gonna make an intent for the jukebox service. I'm gonna tell it some action and then I'm gonna start a service. So you could write something like private fun, you know, uh, run service or yeah, do intent, I don't know what, and then you have an action that's a string and then you say uh, make an intent, set the action to be that action you passed in and then start the service. And then here you'll say something like uh, do an intent for that, right? I mean, some kind of helper to save you a couple lines on the next track getting clicked, instead of calling next song, which we don't have that function anymore, now you might call this, but you might say, you know, next track action. And then down here, uh, instead of clicking to say stop song, you might say, hey service, please do the stop action, right? Is this sort of making sense so far? In the code over here, you'd sort of say else if the intent dot action is jukebox service dot next track action, and then you'd have one more for uh, stop action. So I mean, it's a little bit of a pain because you're sort of taking code that used to all be in one place and now you're sort of slicing it in two and moving it and adding all these dumb intents and messages everywhere and stuff. But I mean, whatever. I thought it, I still thought it would be helpful to sort of start with the app the way that you guys would have written it last week or something, you know, using what you already know and then turn it into kind of the more android -y way where it'll do the right thing with a service, right? That's the plan here. So how do I play a song? Well, I have a method in the service called play song. <laughs> play uh, next song and, uh, oh wait, next song is if you say next track. Uh, let me come back to that in a second. Um, and then here stop action is stop song. Um, the, the problem with this one is um, when you say play, there's sort of like two meanings for that. It's like, um, do you mean play the song that you're currently like on? Because there's a notion of like a current index, or do you mean like play a specific song? 
So, I mean, those are kind of different things, but um, maybe what you would do is, um, you know, if you say play, you might want to pass which song you want to play or something like that. Because um, isn't it true up here, you want to play a song at a certain index. So I think there's like kind of two things. There's like play current song or play a specific song. So maybe I want to come up here and say like play uh, index action, play index. And so like here when you, um, when you click things on the item listener, I'm going to say uh, play song at index, index. And then here I'm going to do uh, where? Uh, da, 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 da. I don't really have a function for this. Um, fun index is an int. So I think what I want is like, if I want to pass it a specific index to play, in addition to the action, I can put an extra piece of data. So I can go like intent.put extra index is this index. So like sometimes when you when you tell a service to do something, you send it parameters. And sometimes just the action alone is enough. If you say stop, it's just stop, right? But if you say, and if you say next track, I think you don't have to tell it which one there either because the service probably sort of knows which track it's currently on. So if you say go to the next one, it just goes to one after that. But remember I have that whole list view. I could click on any of them arbitrarily. So there's a place where they clicked on the fourth one. I need to tell the service, please play track four, right? I have to send the four to the service, right? Um, so I put that in there as extra parameter. So I think maybe over here when I'm looking at these different actions, um, maybe what I'll do is I'll say uh, if the action is play index, then I'll say um, in, in, or val index equals intent uh, dot um, get int extra named index, right? Uh, why doesn't it like that? Oh, I have to pass a default, default zero, whatever. Um, so now I know the index, so now I can say play song at that index. There. So my, I mean, I've already got the logic to do that. I just had to like send the message properly from one side to the other. Um, I think probably I've written enough code that I should be testing it. Um, so let's see. I think I have my actions all set up. Let's run this with the service and see how it goes. Uh, so the problem, though, is like it's kind of hard to test this stuff because you <laughs> you start your song playing and then you quit out of the app, it's kind of hard to force the phone to throw the app away. You know what I mean? So, okay, let's let's play a song. I, I mean, it'll be a victory of some sort if the song plays, right? So, I'll try to stop it. So, I don't know. This is one of those things where, like, the demo sucks because it just does the same thing that it did before, but you sort of have to take my word for it that it's doing it better. <laughs> it's doing the same thing differently than it did before. Um, I mean, I think what's just, frankly, more likely to happen when you go try to do this, because it'll be your first time trying to do this ever in your life, you'll probably find that it just doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, or maybe you're a rock star. Maybe it will work. But... Like the first time I tried to write a service, I clicked and the whole app closed. And then several times after that, I would click and just sort of nothing would happen. So, I mean, I don't know what to tell you. Like, this is where you got to use your debugging skills, right? Like, if nothing had played, if the audio hadn't played, what's some sort of the stuff that you guys would have done at that point? Try to figure out what's going on. Like, what's your debugging strategy there if that's what happened? Nothing, nothing at all happens. I mean, I'm assuming after we stop sobbing into our pillow or whatever, right? Then what do we do? Do you have an idea? Yeah, log.d. Where would you put log statements? Probably around there to see what kind of data we're getting. Yeah, log in the um, service and say, hey, I'm in the on start command function. Here's what uh, action is in my intent right now. If you don't see that message, it didn't even start the service properly. Maybe you didn't even launch the service. Okay, well, that's a good starting point. Uh, maybe over here, I put some log statements here. Like, I want to see on one side of this message, on the activity side, did I build together the right intent with the right action, with the right extra, with the right everything? 
log that, and then on the other side in the service, in the on start command, log there, did I, did I get there, <laughs> you know? Uh, I remember when I was like undergrad, I would write a lot of print statements that would say like, I am here now, you know, <laughs> and now I'm also up here, and then I'd look and see, right, you know, so it's, it's almost like that sort of thing, like seeing if you even get to the spot in the code, but also like printing the state of things, printing the values, making sure. I've definitely done that where um, I think one of the most common bugs I've had is where like I'll call it like index here when I'm setting this extra thingy, and then over here I'll call it like position or something and it's just like it's null or it's zero or it's like what what and um, just you know you got to print these things out and see what's going on in there so if it had crashed what if I had pressed the play button and the whole app shuts down I take the requisite amount of time to you know sob and all of that then what do I do app shuts down what do I do I can still do log statements your answer is still good anything else I could do yeah Yeah, go to the run tab, look for the angry red stuff, right? Go to the log cap, maybe there's some stuff in there. Yeah, you guys know how to do this, right? Go to the red stuff, find the blue stuff in the red stuff, click on the blue stuff, look at that line. Okay, I mean, sorry, I'm not trying to like patronize you. You probably know some of that. I'm just saying like, I'm surprised how often students are thrown for a loop by a change of context where like they do have, you guys do have good debugging skills in Qt Creator in C++, but then if you have the exact same sort of problem in Android Studio, you go, I don't know. And I get it. It's like sometimes it, it's not clear which of your knowledge transfers, right? But I just want you to remember that you can log and you can you can toast and all the stuff you would do to try to find a bug in the other program, you can do in a program with a service too. So don't forget that. Um, okay, so like I basically have my program running. That's most of the work that I wanted to do. Oh, I didn't, I guess I didn't do the maybe coolest part of the demo, if there is a cool part, where you play and you quit. I mean, whatever, like, it's kind of a bullshit demo because, like, the original version would have kept playing too. <laughs> but, like, not forever. You know, we could sit here and hang out till. 4.30 when I have my meeting if you want to see how long it'll play. But um, anyway, that's that's kind of cool. Um, the one, there is one thing kind of missing here though, right? Like, think about a real music player that isn't as crappy as this. When you exit out of the... Sorry, we don't need to hear Guile's music, do we? Um, uh, how do I... Can't I get back? Oh, it's this button. There. <laughs> kind of cool. I can come back. I can stop. So, you know, you guys have learned these life cycle methods. On, pause, on, stop. You can still do stuff in those methods. Um, services don't take the place of that. It's just that services do something in that moment that you can't do just with those methods. You can't have an on, like imagine you don't know what a service is. So you try to write like an on, pause, or an on, stop that says spawn a thread and keep playing the music over there. You know, maybe that will keep the music going and then I don't need a service. But what you have to understand is like threads are part of a process, part of a program. I don't know how many classes you all have taken, but like a process is like a program mostly and a thread is a little piece inside of a program that's executing. So you could have multiple threads inside of one process, one program. When your app gets shut down and flushed out, the whole process gets chucked. So any threads you have get chucked out too. So a thread won't save you here, but this service keeps running. So anyway, we're doing pretty good, but so if you're having a real music player and you exit it out of the UI like this, but you were playing a song, what's missing? Yeah. Um, a notification where you can, you know, pause and do all those functions. Yeah, in a real player that's not crappy like this one, there's like a thing that looks like a notification, and I mean, it is a notification, but it's got little buttons on it and stuff, right? Hmm. I don't know if we know how to do that, do we? Maybe we could do that. Well, so we learned a little bit about notifications last time, right? What if, um, so, I mean, I think this raises some interesting design questions. Like, okay, we could maybe make a notification like that appear on our screen. But, I mean, it raises the question of like, well, how do you make it have all the little buttons on it? The play button and stop button or something. Also, when should it appear? You know, like there's, there's some weird things going on there. So what if we put the code for that um, 
you know, just like here in on start command. Now, it's not clear if that's where it should go, but what if I wrote a function called just like private fun make player notification? So you understand what I'm saying? Like I want to create a notification that will stick around uh, with play, stop, whatever buttons on it. You guys have seen this before, right? You play your music, you've got the little notification. So, okay. Do you remember how to make a notification? There's a notification builder thing, right. Um, but I, this is a place where I don't think I trust myself to type it out uh, from memory because um, it's got that notification channel stuff and um, that stuff just sucks. So I don't think I remember how to type that without looking at the slide. So you can copy the slide too if you want. Let's go remember how to make a notification, blah, 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 blah. So it looks something like this. Um, let's copy this and let's paste it. So I gotta import some stuff. Um, it wants a, an icon uh, oh, you know, I have some icons like on the buttons and stuff, but I didn't really make an icon for the jukebox. Do I have a dot jukebox? I don't know if that'll work. <laughs> it's this big picture of a jukebox that I brought in just in case we needed it. I don't know if that'll work for a small icon, but we'll try it. Um, so let me just make sure everything's imported. Okay. Um, it wants you to pass some sort of ID to associate with your notifications. So typically I make a constant for that up here somewhere. Like I'll make a um, const val uh, jukebox notification ID. And I just, I, I like to make it 193 plus something, like just this 193A. Uh, could I do 0x193A? <laughs> that's kind of cool. Um, that's less than 65535, isn't it? It has to be less. Um, whatever, anyway, you pick a number and then you pass that as your ID when you create your notification, okay? Um, now let's talk about, we didn't really get into like how would I make a notification with little buttons and little gizmos on it, things that you could do. So let's talk about that. In terms of the terminology of a notification, there's all these different pieces and I think the most common notification sort of has a, a title and some content text and maybe an icon. And then typically, it would have sort of a, if you tap it, it would do something. Maybe it would jump back to the app that the notification came from, perhaps with some sort of initial state or information to, to show you, right? Um, we saw that with the downloading program. But if you want there to be like little buttons here, things that you can do, those are also called actions. So let's learn how to add actions to a notification. Um, this code has sort of a default action associated with it. And that's fine, we could do that. That would be like if you tap anywhere on the notification, it'll do it. Um, do, 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 do. Notification chat, here. Multiple actions. If you want your notification to have like several little buttons on it, here's what you do. <laughs> There's lots of builders in Android. Um, you must like Bob the Builder when they wrote this stuff. So you make a notification.action.builder and you pass in the icon it should have, the text that it should show, and an intent of what it should do when you click on it. And you can do that for as many um, notification actions as you want. And then as you're doing your overall notification builder, you can say add action and you can pass that guy that you built up there and now he'll appear as a button. Okay, let's try. Let's try to do, um, you know, next track and stop, or just some some couple of buttons on here. Okay, so um, oh yeah, before I before I do that, I need that channel crap. Remember that? I hate this thing. This makes me so mad. So I need this. Boo. Um, like that, and I import. So you're supposed to have an ID and a name, and so I have to admit, I don't think I understand 
what makes a good name for these things, but jukebox notification name, and I'll call it CS193A jukebox or something. It seems like it just needs to be some sort of mostly unique string, I guess. So down here when you're making this notification channel crap, you pass your ID and you pass your name. Uh, oh, is that also supposed to be the string? Sorry, okay, whatever. Or ID dot to string. Oh, whatever. Um, so now I've got a builder here. And, um, uh, sorry, so I have to just move this code down. I know I'm sort of jumping around. Okay, there. I think I just patched that. There. Ugh. I mean, every time I write a notification, I copy and paste the same stuff, basically. Um, it's what they call boilerplate code, right? Well, the plate code is bad, so you shouldn't have to write it. Um, okay, let's try to make one of these little action guys. That was on that on the next slide. Oh, do I have another problem here? Uh, is this supposed to be my channel? Wait, what's the... Um, sorry, hold on a second. Uh, it says ID. Oh, so I'm supposed to pass the name of the... No, no, no. There, how about that? Okay, there. Sorry about that. Um... <clears throat> So now, basically, before you build your notification, you have to make some actions. So let's make val action one, or maybe this is the um, let's let's try to make an action that stops the um, the music from playing. Okay, that seems like the thing you'd want to most urgently do <laughs> is stop your Street Fighter Two music from playing. <laughs> so because it's it's playing and it's during your midterm and people just don't want to hear that. So um, let's make it be notification.action.builder and you pass in the ID of the icon on it so that's gonna be like I've got some icons here res drawable I've got like a stop icon I've got a play icon these are the same icons that are on the buttons in the in the activity I can use those so I'll say um, r dot drawable dot stop icon and then the title of it I can say stop and then I'm supposed to pass a pending intent. So to make a pending intent, remember what a pending intent is? It's just this dumb object that makes it more confusing where it kind of is a wrapper around an intent. S stupid, right? Um, the uh, pending intent looks like this. You say pending intent dot get activity and then you pass the activity zero, the intent zero. Um, so you say val pending equals pending intent dot now one thing that's not on the slide is that there's also a method called get service now I think this is a little confusing because what's implied by the slide here and what I did on Tuesday was I popped up a notification that said your download is finished and if you tapped it it jumped you back into the app to see something about the download right and so what that means is when I tap on you, I want to jump to this activity. I want this app in this particular activity to appear on the screen, right? But in this case, I actually don't want tapping on the notification on the stop button to pop up the music player. That's not what I want. I just, in the background, want the damn music to stop, right? <laughs> so that is not a message that needs to be sent to the activity. That is a message that needs to be sent to the service. Do you understand that? It's important to send the message to the right place. So, pending intent dot get activity means give me a pending intent that's going to launch an activity. I don't want that. I want a pending intent that is going to launch a service. And it takes, I think, four parameters. Uh, it takes, uh, I think you say this zero intent zero, right? Isn't that the, yeah, but I need an intent here. So now what intent do I pass to the pending intent? I would think of it as if I was over here. Remember how I make these intents and I say, hey, do this action. I can build a similar sort of thing here. I can say val stop intent is an intent that runs the jukebox service class and it runs it with the action of uh, stop action. 
so I will pass the stop intent. So this is weird because it's like I'm packaging up a little message for myself for later. It's like you ever buy yourself a box of cookies or ice cream and you, you suck it away somewhere and then later you find it and you're like, yes, thank you, past me. That's like I'm sending myself a little, little something here. So I make a pending intent that I'm going to stop later. I uh, put that pending intent in here in this action. I say build. So now I have an action for that. I tell my notification builder to add an action for that stop action. And now I tell it to build itself. So <laughs> there's a lot of pieces there. <laughs> I, I really object to all this. I really think it should be easier to do some of these things. Um, let's see if this works. Uh, <laughs> it worked earlier, but I'm a little scared. There's so many moving parts here. This is definitely one of those lectures where there's about a 60% chance that the whole thing will just explode at some point and I'll have to dismiss you. Um, okay, here we go. So I think, I think on any action it'll launch the um, notification. So Oh, uh, <laughs> um, so remember those debugging skills we're supposed to work on? <laughs> Do you sharp-eyed uh, young geniuses see any uh, things that might be buggy here? So this function is called make player notification, right? Seemed like we were doing pretty good stuff. If you got real sharp eyes, you might notice that the method name is gray. That's what Android Studio does if you have never called that method anywhere in your code. See if I hover, it says, you never used this function. So, I mean, this is all great, but I didn't call it. I didn't tell it to do any of this, so I got to do that. Okay, so I think what we said was kind of up here in start command. Maybe I would just call it there. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that that's where we should call it, but just I want to call it from somewhere. So, okay, let's try it again. Cross those fingers. Maybe we can get this to work. <clears throat> okay, here it goes. Developer warning. What did that say? <laughs> uh, failed to post notification C log for details. <laughs> uh, so, stop. It might be because of that index thing. Um, so, when I've seen that message before, it was because I wasn't doing this channel crap properly. Like when I didn't have this code at all for this channel stuff. Uh, what if I do name twice? Uh, let's try that real quick. I'll be sort of out of tricks after that. If I can't get it to work, I won't sit here and fuss with it, but... <laughs> wow! Title, text, stop! <laughs> I don't know why I find that so funny, but... Wait for it. Check this out. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Um, there's some stuff still to be worked out here. I'm going to stop there. But, like, I think what's left to do with this, you could probably go figure out pretty fast, right? Like, the fact that it says title and text is because literally I just didn't change that from the copy pasting that I did, right? And, uh, I'm a little confused. I think this little bell is not the... Oh, you know why it's a little bell? You know why that looks like a Taco Bell thing there? It's because I set the icon to be jukebox, and the jukebox icon looks like this. And you might say, well, it doesn't look like a, a Taco Bell, but if you shrunk it and took the outline of it, it would look like a Taco Bell. The way that Android's notification system works is they don't want the notifications to blast you with a million colors. So whatever picture that you use, it turns it into a one-bit color. 
where it's either transparent or it's like filled in. And so this particular image has kind of a transparent background around the edges here. And so if you look at the screen, that's like the part around the Taco Bell there. But any pixels that are any color at all, whether it's white, whether it's black, whether it's gray, pink, purple, whatever, that will fill in as kind of this dark color. So when you make, if you're, I don't know if you do like any Photoshopping or whatever, but like you have to tell it to use a transparent background and that's the pixels that it won't fill in. And then any other thing that's not transparent, it will fill in. So that's kind of why it's doing that. I thought this little stop guy here was supposed to have a stop icon. Didn't we set that? That was the one thing that confused me. This action. Yeah, we passed in the stop icon. I'm a little, I thought it was going to use that icon. Maybe I'll check on that later. But hey, the action worked. And of course, you could extrapolate like how I would add several other, the next track, you know, all that stuff is just the same kind of code as what I did here, right? So I'm not going to repeat it. You guys get the idea, right? So do you have any questions? Like, does this make sense? I mean, I wanted to do another like non-trivial example of services and notifications so that you'd see all these pieces kind of talking to each other again. So you got any questions about this code? More to the point, do you feel like you could do this, but instead of songs, it might be like messages coming in or whatever. It could be some other sort of gizmo that you're responding to. That's really the, the thing of it, right? If I post these examples and you look at them, I bet you can do it. Um, so, okay, I want to switch topics. So um, if you've got anything you want to say about services, you should let me know now. But I want to talk about something totally different for the time we have left, and I may continue it into next week as well. I want to talk about apps that have a user login. we got about 20, 30 minutes left, so I'll see how far I get on this, okay? Um, <clears throat> so I think, I think you understand the motivation here. Like a lot of apps, you log in and you make an account or you have an account, you have some sort of identity, right? And that's important to the app. It, it, it uses settings for you, or you have a persona. You're writing messages that other people are reading, and they're written by you, by your username or, or something, right? You have some kind of identity inside of the app. And we haven't talked about that at all up to this point, mostly just because it's kind of tricky. <laughs> and because you don't really need an identity to play a stupid snake game, so we didn't talk about it yet. But it's important. Um, there's lots to be said about logging into apps, but I, I mean, I'm kind of doing the fast version here. like. There's the notion of what's called authentication, which is like figuring out who you are. What's your email? What's your password? What's your name? What's your uh, device ID or GPS coordinates? Somehow I decide who you are. I'm authenticating who you are, okay? So logging in would be a way of authenticating. Or a fingerprint scanner. My phone has a fingerprint thingy on the back. That authenticates me. The phone knows who I am based on me touching it. Um, there's a separate issue which is called authorization, which is like, okay, I know that you are Emily, but what activities is Emily allowed to do? Can she delete data? Can she post messages? Has she been banned for, you know, posting discriminatory remarks again or what? You know, like, these are questions. So what is she authorized to do? That's separate from her, even if she's properly authenticated, that does not necessarily authorize her to do everything, right? Okay, so if you want to make an app that has users and authentication and stuff, you can code all of it from scratch. This is not recommended. Or you can use some sort of library that helps you. And then your app, maybe on its back end, has some notion of the users and their passwords and stuff. And this library maybe helps you to verify people against that. That's slightly better. Another thing you can do, a third thing, is you can just completely punt on this and farm it all out to some company like Google or Facebook and have your login be that way. You guys have seen this, right? You run certain apps and it'll say, do you want to create an account or do you want to log in with Facebook? Do you want to create an account or do you want to log in with Google? Right? That's what I'm, that's, the login with company is option three here. And the make your own account is either option one or two, but it's probably two because these companies don't want to write this stuff from scratch. Yeah. Uh, do these uh, like big companies like Facebook, Google, and all of them do they charge you if you want like if you want to use their logins on your app? So do they charge you? Uh, the short answer is no, not for little apps like us. Um, if you had like a million users and they were all logging in all day long, at some point you have enough traffic that Google wants you to pay them money. 
But a lot of these services, what they do is they sort of let you have free access up to 100,000 logins a day, which is like way more than enough for this class. But if you actually have a startup that's like becoming a unicorn, Google wants a cut. You know? <laughs> or you've got to rewrite your authentication code. Um, so, I mean, for our purposes, it's free, luckily. Uh, so, okay, let's talk about these different options for just a second. Just humor me here. Remember how we talked about databases and Firebase and stuff? You could have a table of users or students or whatever, and the table could have usernames and passwords in it. You could ask the user their username and their password, and then you could search the database and see if it was right. And if it was right, you could think of the user as being logged in now, and you could remember who they logged in as as a, as a preference or a piece of state or something. You could do that. Uh, <laughs> It's probably not that hard for you to picture how that code would look. Okay, I just compare the strings to each other. This is deceptive because it's not that hard to write this, but you will probably mess it up in some way that is not secure, and that's the death of any app that's trying to actually get users. You know, if you discover some app leaked your password, leaked your credit card number, or something like that, you're out. You switch to a different app. So you don't want to do this. There's a lot of security issues here. I mean, not the least of which is you should never, never store passwords just sitting in a database table like this. I mean, if you've done security stuff, that would be obvious. But if you haven't, it might not be obvious. Why? I mean, the reason is basically because if someone ever hacks this app or hacks the server that it talks to and is able to somehow dump or download out the table of data, they get all the people's passwords out. Now you might say, well, if they hack the server, don't they get all the data no matter what? Yeah, fine, but what you probably would do is you would store the passwords encrypted, and then the encrypted passwords, even if the bad guys get them, they often cannot tell what password led to that gibberish. I, I'm not qualified or interested to give you a security lecture. I think one of the wisest things you can know about security is to know that you are bad at security and accept that and be careful because you know you're bad at security. That's kind of the comfort I have reached here about this. So I've just learned, like, don't try to write an encryption system. Don't try to write a security login system all on your own. You will mess it up, and then you'll, you'll pay for that. So I mean, the sort of ABCs of this that I don't want to go into a lot of detail on is like a lot of these encryption systems are one way, where if you start with the password, you can run it through the encryptor or the hashing function, and you'll get the gibberish long string. But they don't have a reverse. You can't go from the gibberish back to the original password. So like, and not easily anyway. So even if somebody downloaded this database table, they wouldn't necessarily know exactly what password the people had. So that's a little better. Um, so you could write this yourself. It is done. I've done this. I, I have an app called Code Step by Step that students use to practice Java and C++. And I wrote my own login system for it. And so far, as far as I can tell, no one has hacked it. But that's the thing. You just never know. <laughs> you just never know. Um, so I don't recommend this. One thing, other thing you could do is you can use a library. Hey, Firebase has an authentication system. There were a couple of slides on this back in the Firebase lecture, and I didn't reach them. I didn't talk about them. You can have Firebase create. So you know, with, I don't know how many of you chose. Maybe I'll ask you, show of hands, how many of you used Firebase on your animal game? Okay, half third of you. So, so like, it's fine. If you did, um, you set up your database there. Firebase has other features. You can also tell it, I want to use Firebase's authentication feature. And then Firebase has some functions where you can say, I either want to create a user with the following name and password, or you say, I'd like to sign in with the following name and password, and it'll tell you if it succeeded or failed. And then what's happening is Firebase is somehow keeping some sort of magical secret internal database of all those accounts, and it's verifying the passwords and encrypting them for you and stuff. You still write the code for a lot of this, um, but Firebase helps you. So that's, generally speaking, better than writing your own system, I would say. It's also easier, mostly. Um, Firebase actually has two ways that you can do things. One way is the thing that I just described, where it's sort of a back end, where you have your app, and the login screen has your widgets, and your buttons, and your fonts, and you have a blank that says, type your username, and you have a blank that says, type your password. And then when they say, go, then you call Firebase and say, hey, is this the right password? And Firebase says yes or no. So Firebase is just sort of a verifier in the back. Or Firebase, you know, you can say, I want to make a new account, and it'll make it for you. So it's like a utility that sits underneath your UI. Or you can go further, and you can just make Firebase pop up the UI of the login screen. It can have an activity that pops up for you. 
and you type in whatever, and then Firebase sends the messages and comes back, and you can have Firebase sort of be more involved, if you will, where Firebase is actually visibly displaying widgets for you and stuff. Um, and there's pros and cons to each one. I think, obviously, like if you have it pop up its own UI, you have less control, but it, you don't have to write as much code. Um, one of the benefits of, of the uh, sort of having Firebase do its own UI uh, approach is that is a bridge toward using some of these other logins, like login by Google, login by Facebook, and I'll show you that. So um, <laughs> it, I have to say one of the things that's unfortunate about this is that um, there's all these libraries and dependencies, and frankly, there's about 100 ways it can go wrong, and so it's sort of frustrating to try to work on because I don't think the code is conceptually that hard, and then you try to run it, it doesn't work, and it's just aggravating. This is kind of how it goes. So you have to attach a bunch of libraries in your build file, um, and you have to go to Firebase and create a Firebase for your project. You guys remember, like, you, you go into Firebase and you're into Android Studio, and you if you did Firebase, you might remember this. You say, Tools, Firebase. And it actually has some pretty nice stuff in here to help you. So you click on, like, I want authentication. I'm not going to do that because I don't want that for my jukebox. <laughs> but um, I do have another project. Uh, I think given the time, I'm not going to write a lot of this code with you. I'm going to show more than type. Um, but we wrote a program in the past called Simpson Grades. And let me just run it real fast. And uh, this was my Firebase demo program I wrote a few weeks ago before Homework 5 went out. And what the program does is it has a data set of grades and students and teachers and stuff that's sort of analogous to SQL tables I showed you before. And it lets you log in and it lets you look up a student's grades. Uh, so here, it has a login screen where you say, what's your name, what's your password? And you type like Bart, and your password is Bartman or whatever his password is. And you say, log in. And if your password is right, Oh, user not found, Bart. Uh, is it by email, bart at fox.com? So, oh, no, 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 it's capital B. It's, by, <laughs> it's his name with a capital B. Yeah, whatever. Uh, so, we wrote that. I have not modified this. This is from like a few weeks ago. It already had a login screen, but it was like literally looking up passwords in some row of a table or something. This is like approach one where you write your own login system, and I just told you not to do that. <laughs> But I, you know, two weeks ago me didn't didn't listen to right now me, right? Um, so what you would do instead if you wanted Firebase to help you out is you'd go back to this project and you'd say, well, I want Firebase and I want the authentication package here. And you'd say, I want email and password authentication. Now, if you hadn't done it before, you would have some buttons here that would say, I'd like to connect my app to Firebase. Click. I'd like to have authentication. Click. And then it has some like pieces of code, which unfortunately is in Java, that it wants you to use here. So like essentially, this little flow here is helpful to kind of set up all your little Gradle files. It does some of that for you. If you say, set up, do it, do it. It'll do a lot of it for you, which is pretty cool. So now I'm sort of ready to type the code that I'll show you in a second on my slides, you know? Because if you haven't got Firebase like attached correctly to your project, it's not going to work, right? So. Um, you set up some of these libraries, and again, some of this gets done by that uh, by that uh, you know setup tool that I just showed you a second ago. Um, so now you make an object of type Firebase auth, like authenticator. You say Firebase auth.get instance, and then there's a couple things you could do with that object once you have it. You can either create a user with a certain email and a certain password, and pass them as strings. This is one of these uh, sort of asynchronous things that starts off in the background. And so if you want to wait for it to be done, this function returns before it's done. So you have to, if you want to wait till it's done, you have to say add on complete listener, which is a lambda that waits for the task to be done. And then you can ask if it was successful or not. So if it is, a user got created with this email. It, should, it says username, but they want you to use an email address and password. So you can use that to make a new account. So where would this code go? Like I just have code floating here on this slide. You'd put this in some sort of uh, activity. Like I don't have a create new user activity here, but you could imagine one that looked mostly like this. And it would say, you know, make a new account. Tell me your information. And it would say email, and you type your email. It would say password. What do you want your password to be? And you type it in. And you click log in or, or create account or whatever. And it would do this in response to that button click. It would do this, you know. So then um, once it created the account, maybe it would show you what grades you had or whatever. It would transfer to some other activity with an intent at that point. 
Um, so that's how to create an account with Firebase. You can also go to their web UI. Um, the UI of Firebase has uh, a viewer. Uh, I was playing around with it a second ago. Uh, what project do I want? So let's go Simpson Grades. So like you could go in here. It has a JSON viewer where you can see all your data. Um, you can look at your database here. You can also go to your authentication. See over here on the left, there's an authentication. But where, where is this? This is just on the Firebase website. They have a Firebase console that has all your projects in it. So you can go to their authentication tab, and you can add all the people who are, you know, if, if you want to, you could come in here. Uh, I'm not sure why my buddy Cynthia Lee is in this. I don't remember if she wanted access to Bart Simpson's grades for some <laughs> reason, but whatever. Maybe she's my test case. Um, so anyway, you can create a user here, or you can create a user in code right here, right? Once you've created an account, you can sign in an existing account with a pretty similar piece of code. It's just instead of saying create user, you say sign in user. You pass the email and the password, and when it's done, it'll tell you if it was successful or not. If it was successful, you transfer to the other activity and show the person's grades. Um, one, one thing I think some students have asked me where they get a little confused about is like, how does the app like know who's logged in? Like, okay, I, I got logged in here, great. But now how do I sort of generally speaking know who I am in the code? How do I know who I am who's logged in? Well, I mean, I think there's some method where you can say auth.getCurrentUser, I think. Uh, is that on the next slide? Uh, no, but, but like there's some kind of method for that, but even if there weren't, like right at this moment, you know that you logged in with that email and that password. So like save them somewhere. Save them in your private fields. Save them in your preferences. Save Your app has ways of remembering things, so just do that. If you want to take that information and go to another activity, pass those things as extras to the other activity, and now it will know that as well. So your app can like know who you are and who's logged in, right? So that's not like impossible to remember that. So that's it. I mean, that's a pretty fully functional login system. Again, it doesn't have the, it doesn't do the UI for you. Like I still had to write the code for this screen, and I still had to pluck out the text here and then pass that to Firebase. So Firebase was doing what you might call the back end of the login system for me, right? Um, okay. Does that make sense? Do you guys have questions about uh, kind of what this is doing, what it doesn't do? Yeah. I mean, what about the thing in? Like when you create a user account, they ask you for your email, and like they send you an email to verify and all that. Does Firebase do that? Right. Um. So, Firebase has methods for that. Yeah. Um. I didn't put it on the slide, but like it has. I think it's called like. There's a method in here called like dot verify email true or something. Like it actually has some pretty interesting methods. It has a method where you can have it send a text message to the person. Um. A lot of the stuff you would sort of want it to have is in here. And I have to admit, like, my slides are sort of like the, the narrow path to get it to work. And, like, I think if you want to learn about some of the other features, you should look up what are the methods of, like, Firebase auth and kind of what, what different variables that are there for you to use. So it's a starting point. Um, so, okay, so that's pretty cool. That's if you want to roll your own authentication, but you want help on the back end managing all the passwords, managing all the accounts, right? Let me show you the next level up, which is, like, I don't even want to deal with account. I don't even. This this took me a minute to understand when I was first learning about this. You know, in my when I was writing web apps or something. This notion that like I won't even have accounts. You know what I mean? Like I just showed you a system where the app has its own accounts, but I have help managing them. But you still like imagine we're making the Simpson Grades program. You have a Simpson Grades account, and you have a Simpson Grades account, and they're they're from that app. You know, it has nothing to do with any other account. It's not from Google. It's not from Facebook. This is very different. This is like all of the notion of who the users are and what their identity is and what their personal information is is completely external to your app. It's managed by some company. Um, so I'm old. So to me, this is weird, and I kind of dislike it, frankly. Because I just sort of, I don't know about you guys, but when I go online, like if I go to Reddit or something, what if I want to do a bunch of shit posting? you know? Like I want to make fun of Star Wars or Harry Potter, and I just sort of don't want that to get back to me. I don't really want Reddit to know my Gmail and my Facebook and my Twitter. I don't always want everything all linked together. Um, and in fact, when I first made my Reddit account, I named it Marty Stepp, and I was like posting a few messages here and there, and then I realized, like, wait, it's super obvious that that's me. So if somebody finds me like posting about Seinfeld or something, I don't. Maybe I don't want them to read that. So uh, make it make a burner account with a fake name, right? Or or you make a 
Finsta? Is this a thing, right? So, so like, if you, if you know that you would want to have a Finsta, then you would understand that sometimes you don't want to link your Facebook to every random website, right? So I, a lot of times when I go to a site and they give me a choice between like create your own little account just for this site or use your Google account, use your Facebook account, I just make the little account for this site. But my understanding is that I'm weird, my generation is weird, and that most of the young folks just like want to use their accounts and just use their Facebook, just use their Twitter, just use their Google. What do you guys think? Do you guys like to reuse your company accounts or do you like to make new accounts? <laughs> eh? It's like finding the best way of like, because you don't want like your like main like kind of like email or something to be cluttered with like all the things that you don't really care about. So it's like finding the perfect balance of all that. I see. So it's more about like will the thing spam you or something? It's like partially lazy and partially not wanting to be spammed. There's kind of a trust component, right? You're like, I don't know, this like random sketchy like meme app. I don't know if I want to tell it my Facebook and my Google, so I'll make up a fake account. But maybe if it's for my bank or something, I trust them. I don't know what, right? Anyway, whatever your opinion is, you can do this. Um, there's some pros and cons. I sort of mentioned some of them here. Um, there's always the chance that this company would go under <laughs> or that they would stop offering this service because it didn't make them enough money. And then your code, you would have to rewrite or change or something. That could be bad. Um, or this company has a massive breach. All them, their accounts get hacked. And you go, oops, now my app got hacked, you know, basically because of that. Um, whatever, right? Or, or like just one of them goes out of style. Like, I guess a lot of your, you, your guys' generation don't really like the Facebook so much anymore. And so maybe, you know, maybe if I set all my accounts around that, I'm limiting the people who have a Facebook account, et cetera, right? There's some pros and cons here. Also, I think there's a little bit of a data privacy thing where like the company is noticing this person used this app and this person used that app. And I think they're like monitoring that and recording it and logging it and who knows where that's getting used for something. So I don't know, I, there's some cons here. But the nice thing is these people, it is nice if you already have an account, you can just leverage that on your app as well. So, um, this is kind of the part where I'm going to wave my hands and I'm not going to totally like run, write and run all this code in front of you guys, I think. Um, but what you can do is in Firebase, in this console that hopefully you could find if you, if you used Firebase, um, under authentication, there are these tabs over here called sign in method. Do you see this? So if you click sign in method, these users right here are just like built in Firebase users for my app. If I click sign in method, it gives me a bunch of choices. And I can turn them on and off. I can say I want to allow e email password is what we were doing before, what I showed the slides for, and what those users on the previous screen were for. But you can say I want to turn on phone, like you could call a number or text or something. You could turn on Google authentication. You could turn on Facebook or Twitter authentication. So you turn them on. Now, I will admit, this is where it gets a little messy, which is why I'm not going to do all of it live. Um, if you click in here, it wants you to type in like, some IDs and stuff like uh, where's the Facebook one it wants to know your app ID and your app secret tell me your app secret and it has this information basically what you have to do if you're gonna do this you have to go to Facebook or Twitter or GitHub or whatever service you want for the authentication they usually have a developer page so you can go to um, uh, uh, developers.facebook.com and then there's like a login, and uh, you can you can log in, and then you can say, I want to make a new app, or I want to register a new app, and you say, I'm doing the Simpson Grades app, and it gives you some information, and it says, okay, now go paste this in Firebase, and you paste some of the magic numbers in Firebase, and you take some magic numbers from Firebase, and you paste them into Facebook, and you sort of get these two guys talking to each other, and then they trust each other. Facebook is willing to give credits to them, and your app is willing to trust Facebook, and you kind of have to follow these steps and glue these things together. Um, so, I mean, I just, honestly, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> it I don't want to, it takes a little too long to set it all up, frankly. But, like, that's what you do, and it's fairly straightforward. It just takes a while. Um, so, the one that I think, if you were only going to pick one, the one that's sort of the best, maybe, is Google's. Um, I find it the easiest to get working. And it seems like Google is, like, most people have a Google or a Gmail account, I would say. It's not as, like subject to trends as a lot of social network accounts like Facebook is. Another good one is GitHub. The GitHub login is pretty good, but only nerds can use that, basically. <laughs> so if you just want your app for nerds, like you make an online dating site, but only for CS people, 
GitHub login only. That's the way to do it. Because if they don't have a GitHub, you're not going to get some, right? So um, anyway, you can use that slogan if you like. Um, so there's some stuff here that I'm going to skip because um, it's covered in the setup instructions for how to do this. But you have to make an account and get some information and paste it in. And I'm going to skip it. So there's a couple things you have to do. You have to put some dependencies in your files. I mean, I basically just copy and pasted all this out of their tutorial. And their tutorial is probably better than my thing. And I linked to their thing for my thing. So um, you get your project set up. And then once you've done that, there's a couple things you can do. You can either put a sign-in button on your activity, and it looks like that. Or I'll show you in a second. There's a couple other ways you can do it. Um, so I just find this to be yet another example where there's just a bunch of gobbledygook that you have to copy and paste. So you have to make a Google sign-in client object. And to make that, you need an options object. And the main option that you have to set up is that you say you want the default options, but you want their email addresses, because that's not the default. You get their names and their passwords, like their, their, their real life names, like Marty Step. But if I want their name and their email and their password, you say request email. And then you pass those options, and now you have like a Google object that lets you talk to the Google sign-in system. Then to actually use the sign-in, you, you say start activity for result, and you tell your Google object to give you an intent. This is a property that returns an intent. And you make some sort of request code. We did that a minute ago for um, our services and stuff. And once you start this, it pops up an activity that asks a person to log in with Google. It's pretty cool. And then when it's done, it comes back to your app. We learned about this a long time ago. Start activity is something we've used a lot. Start activity for result is where you start another activity, and when that activity is done, it's going to send something back to you in an intent. And it's going to call a method on you called on activity result. That's like from week three or something we saw this, but we haven't used it much for a while. So you have to write an on activity result function. When the activity result comes in, if it's your Google activity request code that you passed in earlier, you can read the account out of the intent that was sent to you. And that object has the information about who logged in. So if I logged in with my Gmail, it has my name, my Gmail, my password. Well, not my, you can't get the clear text password, but it doesn't let you have that. But it um, has these sorts of methods in it. You can ask for the name, the email, the first and last name. Uh, if they have a profile picture, it'll give you that. So there's a lot of good stuff in there. So you say, hey, give me that account, and give me its email, and give me its name, et cetera. Um, I think I can demo this for you real quick. I'm going to have to stop here. There's a few more slides where I show how to do the Facebook one, and I think I show the Twitter one. It's basically just each one that you want to connect to. You have to go to the tutorial page, and there's a few lines of code you have to copy, and it looks a little bit like this. Um, let me show you. I have an app in progress that I'm working on. I think I can run this. Uh, it's called Tree Chat, and this is likely to be what your homework 7 will be, or at least something similar to this. Uh, it will not probably not look quite this crappy when I'm done with it, but if you say that you want to sign in, um, and you can pop up all the different authentication services. So I got it working with these different guys. So this thing popped up because of the code I wrote. If I say sign in with Google, it is thinking. Now, it went right back to the app because it remembers who I am. Like, if your phone knows who you are, It'll let you sign in. If I had never signed in with this app before, it would have popped up a thing that says, like, are you okay with this? Do you want to sign in with Google or not? So anyway, that's kind of a five-second demo. Um, I'll probably do more with logins next week on Tuesday, but uh, I'm out of time, so i got to stop there. But anyway, thanks. Have a great weekend, and see you next week for week 10, our last week of lecture. See you then.